morning to all of the kids who are with us here. We're grateful that you're, you're in here, a younger bunch this morning. I, I pray the Lord would strengthen your mind and your ears to listen. And God has a way of even overcoming our lack of listening. So we're thankful for his grace in that. I have memories of uh, services as a kid where I'd be totally checked out, just doing whatever in my mind and with my body. And uh, the Lord would just take and just wake me up with a sentence uh, in his grace. So we know that God has the power to overcome all of that. As we think about building on this solid rock, as we think about the Ten Commandments, and and Daniel commented a little on this earlier, you know, the problem with uh, the Jews in Paul's day was that they thought that their own law-keeping was their solid ground, that that's where they would build their house, that's where they would build uh, their lives, and, and Paul's point is to say, you know, the law, it, it doesn't function that way, it functions actually to condemn us. It shows us that we don't keep it, that we are liars and murderers and thieves, idolaters, we dishonor parents, and we need a Savior. And so uh, my prayer for all of us, and particularly for those kids who are with us this morning, is that you would see that as you think about these Ten Commandments, that you would not just set off and say, I'm going to try my hardest to keep these commandments to please mom and dad, but that you, would, that you would desire to keep these commandments, but that you would see in them a mirror of your own sin and your need for Christ, that he died for sinners, he kept the law perfectly, and apart from him, we are condemned by this law. So if you would go with me to Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, that is where we are. And if you're visiting with us today, that's what I'm referring to. We are in the middle of the Ten Commandments as we are working our way through Exodus. So this is not a series on the Ten Commandments per se. Uh, It is a series on Exodus. We're going through verse by verse the the book of Exodus. Uh, But we're in the Ten Commandments, which is a portion of of Exodus here in chapter 20. And as I've said several times before, the Ten Commandments can be divided into two sections. It's not an even divide. We like that. We like five and five. It'd be, for some of us, that would, you know, be, we'd be more content with that. But it is a four and six divide. The first four dealing with love of God, so very much directly vertical in nature. And the latter six dealing with love of neighbor. They are horizontal in nature. Uh, Although we recognize that all the commandments have to do with loving God. And so some of the distinctions that we make, and I've talked about this before with moral and ceremonial and judicial laws and so forth. Some of these distinctions are helpful. And at some point though they begin to kind of fall Apart, And I think that's the case here. All of these laws deal with one's relationship to Yahweh, one's relationship to the Creator, to the Redeemer, to the Lord. Every one of these commandments deals with worship, not just the first three or four as we think about God's covenant with Israel. So as we come to these, we realize, I think, that great truth that that Paul lays out in Colossians 3.23, that whatever we do, we are to do as unto the Lord and not for men. The reason we don't kill people or commit adultery is because we love God. Ultimately, the reason that we honor our parents is because we love God. Of Of course, we love neighbor. We love our parents. We are to love others, but we do it in the end because we love God. We worship him. We do it, all that we do, as unto the Lord. Whether we eat or whether we drink or anything else, we do for the glory of God. Last week, we were in the fifth commandment, which is about honoring parents, treating our mother and father as weighty in our thoughts, our words, and our actions. So it just explodes with application. And I have restrained myself to one sermon on each of these commandments. But really, it could be uh, endless. I mean, there's so many ways that we could apply each of these commandments. And as we think about 
honoring, the verb to honor, as we think about uh, how we are to respect our parents, we consider that uh, behind this verb and within this verb is this idea of weightiness, the significance of our parents, irrespective of their character, irrespective of their treatment of us, that we, once again, do this as unto the Lord regarding our parents in this weighty way. And strictly speaking, this commandment pertains to love of neighbor. As we honor parents and submit to the authorities that God has placed over us, and ultimately as we honor all people, strictly speaking, that pertains to love of neighbor. But this commandment has an interesting place among the others because it functions as a transition. The fifth commandment functions as a transition or a bridge between the two sets. It deals with how we treat other people, obviously, how we treat our parents. And yet we recognize that parents function as representatives of God in the lives of their kids. And so you think of a child growing up in his or her home, and, and the, the idea of God is a very vague and sort of distant idea, but, but that idea of God, that idea of God as father, as we think about that, but that idea of God as authority, as lawgiver, as protector, as the one who cares for us, as provider, all those things that, uh, that they are to understand about God, that, that's funneled through his or her relationship with mom and dad. And so the child relates to God through the parents as the parents function as representatives or ambassadors of the Lord. This is where we learn authority from mom and dad. This is where we learn to submit to the Lord as our one great authority. So uh, as we talked about last week, uh, our children are learning to submit to God as we are requiring them to obey us. And as we said last week, we just don't have the right to do as we please with our kids in terms of permissiveness and letting them go their own way. We, we stand in the place of God to our children, teaching them what it means to submit to authority, to God's authority, to civil authorities, and so forth. We represent him in this important way. And so we recognize that the fifth commandment is both vertical and horizontal in this unique way. And so it it moves, it acts as a nice transition, a nice seam between the first four and the latter six or the latter five after the fifth commandment. Today we come to the sixth commandment. And the title for the sermon this morning is the sixth commandment, no murder. So if you would go ahead and stand with me. We are going to read more than you shall not murder. Uh, That would be quick. Quick stand. Back down. Uh, Verse 13. We're going to read all of uh, the Ten Commandments here. Chapter 20, verses 1 to 17. But our focus today will be on those words there in verse 13. This is the word of God. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God. I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea 
and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. You can go ahead and be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask him to open our hearts, open our minds, not just open our minds to, to understand what's here, but that God would open our hearts to holy affections for him, that he would open up our will to bend it towards obeying him, and that he would manifest the fruit of these truths in our lives. So let's pray and ask that he would do this in us. Lord, we are so dependent on you. We recognize our sinfulness as we look at the Ten Commandments. We think about our old life. We think about the Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 self, uh, the person who was enslaved to the devil and the flesh and the world, the world system. Father, we think about our old life as we were children of wrath, sons of disobedience, dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked. Father, we recognize that old self and even in our new self, We recognize this battle that we fight against this mortal flesh, this mortal body. We recognize this battle, as Paul outlines at the end of Romans 7, that we face as we fight the sin, the the sin within us, indwelling sin. So, Lord, we're humbled by your word. We're humbled by these commandments. And, And yet, Lord, we are elevated to great praise because we consider That we have indeed, for those of us who are Christians, we have indeed been converted. That where we once hated you and did not care for your law and loved self only, Lord, you have made us new. And you have made us truly those who love you and love our neighbor. Though imperfectly, we do love you and we do love our neighbor by your Spirit. And so, God, we thank you that you have converted us, that you've saved us, that you've regenerated us, justified us in your sight, sanctified us definitively, and continuing to sanctify us unto glory. God, we're grateful that we belong to you. We have you as our Father. You are our God, and you are working in us, sanctifying us, making us new, refreshing us, renewing us every day. So, Lord, we pray that you would do this work in us this morning, that you would grow us and help us, strengthen us, comfort us, challenge us, convict us, train us for godliness. Father, we pray that you would help us to love as we think about the end result, the sum of this command and all the rest, that you would help us to love you and love our neighbor as ourself. God, we pray that Your spirit would work in each one of us to apply these words in very specific, incisive ways. And God, that you would root out every form of murder that exists in the hearts of your people here today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So as we try to wrap our minds around the sixth commandment, we're going to look at it from three angles. And it is difficult to determine what all to discuss in some of these. As I said before, uh, most systematic ethics books deal with the Ten Commandments. And uh, the, the couple that have been helpful to me, I think uh, the treatment of the Ten Commandments is four or five hundred pages <laughs> uh, for all the Ten Commandments as a whole. So uh, obviously there's a lot that could be said for each of these commandments. And though in Hebrew there are only two words here, you shall not uh, murder, there is... Uh, There are pages and pages and volumes and volumes of import. But what we're going to do today is look at uh, this command from three angles. We're going to look at it in terms of violence, in terms of anger, and in terms of negligence. So violence, 
anger, and negligence. I think the command applies to us at least in these three ways and directly and immediately uh, as we think about the import for us as we go out and live our lives. So first, in terms of violence. Here we come to the most obvious and basic meaning of the commandment. This is what you just cannot miss. If you miss all the rest, you just cannot miss this. It's right there on the surface. It is the most basic. Do not murder or do not wrongfully take the life of a human being. Your own life, which would be suicide, or the life of another, which would be homicide. And, of course, there's all other kinds of sides. There's patricide and fratricide and so on and so forth. When you talk about specific individuals that are killed, homicide uh, means the killing of man. Suicide and homicide. And this begins with recognizing that human beings are unique on the earth. Uh, there is fundamentally something different, and we recognize this innately, Uh, even though some uh, ethicists, I remember hearing a debate between John Lennox and Peter Singer, uh, an ethicist at at Princeton, and they were talking about, uh, they were talking about God, but, but one of the things he's most known for is the idea that really there's no difference between a child and a pig and, and, and just this sort of stripping away of the distinctions within creation uh, that all, uh, well, not creation as he would see it, but in terms of the evolutionary product. And when we look around, as uh, this view would go, that there really is no difference between the different sorts of creatures, some higher levels of sentience and others not so much but all just evolved from the same source. This is not the worldview of the Bible. This is not the worldview of Christians. This is not the worldview of the Hebrews. We recognize at the base that human beings are unique on the earth. In fact, after recognizing the great distinction between God and creation, the creator-creature distinction, the next most significant distinction in the Bible is that between humans and all other creatures. We are special in God's sight. We are made in God's image and given dominion over the earth. Our dog, we have a, a standard poodle named Ozzy, he cannot have a relationship with Yahweh. Uh, I think that it's amazing how you see the creatures in the world, and, and we just simply don't know the way in which God has wired nature to recognize their creator. Uh, I think there's, that's a fascinating uh, notion. But what we know is that we're not going to wake up in the middle of the night and find our dog praying. We may find him doing a lot of things, but not praying. He cannot have a relationship with his maker. We can He does not disobey his maker. He certainly disobeys me, but he does not disobey his maker. We do disobey and rebel against our maker. We are in God's image. Genesis 1, 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. Female, he created them. So men and women equally created in God's image, human beings. And then in the very next verse, verse 28, there's more about having dominion, made in God's image, and, and being God's representatives on the earth, being over all other creatures. So we're created in God's image. And we, are all, we were also created intimately by the Lord. So we read this in Genesis 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And then in Genesis 2, 22, And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. So not only are we told that we are made in God's image, that there is... In, intrinsic value to human beings that, that is not transferred to other creatures, but we're also told that God made us in this very intimate way, breathing into man's nostrils the breath of life. And building is the word used, building from the rib of the man, the woman, who he then brought to the man in the first marriage ceremony. 
So human life holds a special place for the Lord. Human life holds a special place in God's ordering of creation and in his justice. As God gives us justice in the earth, human life holds a special place that is not held by any other creature. If you've ever seen an animal slaughtered, uh, you recognize the uh, that there is, the, the weight of that is different than if you see a human being killed. It's innate. And no matter how much we deny God, no matter how much we deny uh, the Creator, it is in all of us. It is repulsive to see a human being killed in a way that it is not at all to see an animal killed. In Genesis chapter 9, that's not to denigrate animals though. It's just to say that there's fundamentally different. In Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 to 6, the Lord says this to Noah. And this is prior to the giving of the Mosaic law. He says this to Noah. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. Uh, Sometimes I talk with people about the death penalty and ask me, do I believe in the death penalty? I say, of course I believe in the death penalty. I don't just believe the death penalty is permitted. I believe the death penalty is essential because of what it says here. And for your lifeblood, I require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. It does not surprise me that in societies where the weight of God is felt less, the death penalty goes away. Because you all, the death penalty really only makes sense when God is held up in honor. God's glory, God's image, that's what the death penalty is all about. It's all about vindicating the image of God in man and communicating the weight of that to the world. Wrongfully killing a human being is an affront to God and his glory because people are made in his image. It is about God. As with all the commandments, as with all of morality, as with all justice, it is about God and his holiness and his glory. And so God here in Genesis 9, as Noah constitutes new humanity coming off of the ark with his three sons and their wives and his wife. God gives this to Noah. He instructs him that the wrongful killing of a human being demands the rightful killing of that perpetrator. And notice what I said there. The wrongful killing of a human being demands the rightful killing, the required killing of that perpetrator. Perpetrator, And you will remember how the Lord describes in Genesis 6 the state of the world before the flood. One of the key descriptors in Genesis 6 is that the earth was filled with violence. Murder was at an all-time high. Worse then than it is today even in Chicago. At an all-time high. Murder, rampant on the earth. And so Noah and his sons and their wives and his wife would have lived in that murderous world. They would have seen and heard of all the killings. They would have probably witnessed themselves. People being murdered. So God places this wrongful killing under his own justice that there must be the killing of that perpetrator. To murder brings capital punishment. And we see this idea of execution or capital punishment under the Mosaic Covenant and in the New Testament. So I've talked with some, particularly some 
uh, Christians in Britain uh, because the society there is very opposed to the death penalty in general. And, and so I remember talking with Christians there and just the influence of the culture and the society on their thinking on this issue. And we were talking about uh, Genesis 9. And uh, I remember talking with this believer and they were explaining how, well, you know, after Christ has come and so forth, they're sort of drawing these distinctions. And so I brought them to Romans chapter 13, verse 4, where Paul says that a governing ruler does not bear the sword in vain. And it's difficult to make the sword there anything other than an instrument of execution. Paul goes on to say, but is the servant of God an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. In other words, God has ordained per Romans 13, not just in the Mosaic Covenant, but in human societies across the world, God has ordained that civil government would bear the sword against the wrongdoer. Moving out of Genesis 9, when God commanded this to Noah, he did not ask Noah to do this. He did not suggest that this might be a good idea or a deterrent for society. He did not say that this would be needed in case reformation did not work for the killer. He required it. He demanded it because of his own glory. So there is is a lawful killing and there is an unlawful killing. And it is this second category that is forbidden under the sixth commandment. Now, there has been some debate over whether to translate the Hebrew verb in verse 13 as to kill or to murder. So should this be translated in English, you shall not kill or you shall not murder. But the problem is that kill is simply too general. It is too general because killing in capital punishment and war are not forbidden elsewhere in the law. And so uh, you, you, you're looking at uh, what, what we find elsewhere in the law. These two forms of killing are not forbidden. So the commandment cannot be simply, generally, you shall not kill. The command cannot refer to killing in general. It also cannot refer to killing in self-defense. Since we read this in Exodus chapter 22, verse 2, if a thief is found breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. So a person trying to come in in the middle of the night, they're struck and they're killed, no blood guilt. However, the very next verse goes on to say that if the sun has risen, there is blood guilt. So even there, there's a distinction as we think about even something like home invasion. There's a distinction between daytime and nighttime. There's a distinction between uh, what is known and not known, what can be seen, what danger can be perceived, and the extent of the danger, and the recourse to other means of protecting oneself that would not involve the killing of the perpetrator. So kill is simply to general However, some have objected that murder is too precise. It is too specific since this word is applied to accidental killing in Numbers 35. And Cody read that uh, long passage to us earlier. But in that passage in Numbers 35, we get this word used for those who kill someone accidentally. So this word for murder is used for wrongful, intentional killing as well as accidental killing. And we're going to come back at the end as we talk about negligence. We're going to talk about accidental killing. But I agree, just to sum up how we should understand this word and translate it, I agree with one commentator who describes it this way. (coughs) Since this verb refers to intentional and accidental killing, and the latter being unintentional cannot be prohibited, the command must refer to the former, and you shall not murder remains the best translation. I think it does actually apply to the latter. We'll talk about that at the end. But I think the general logic here is sound, and that is that what we are talking about here is murder. So, the Westminster Larger Catechism, question 136, begins in this way when describing what this commandment is saying. The sins forbidden in the sixth commandment are all taking away the life of ourselves or of others 
except in case of public justice, lawful war, or necessary defense. And I'm not going to wade into these waters, but there's a lot of a writing and a lot of discussion historically about the nature of just war and the complexities of war and the culpability in war as you descend the ranks from those who make war and those who are part of an army engaged in war. War between uh, nations where there are lots of Christians. There are lots of questions surrounding the nature of war and just war, but it has been the prevailing view in the history of the Christian tradition that there is such a thing as just war and that this commandment ought not to be understood to forbid killing in war necessarily. Let me just say also that this is why Christians take things like abortion and euthanasia so seriously. You you will hear Christians advocate against, and many of us have advocated in different ways against these things, particularly abortion. But it is because of this commandment and many other things connected to this commandment that we take these sins so seriously. We believe that these acts are murder, that life begins at conception. And it ends at natural death. We believe these acts are murder, that they are against the sixth commandment, that they are against the image of God. And ultimately, that is the concern of the Christian. The image of God. Though we love our neighbors and desire that even the smallest of them not be murdered. But as we've seen before, the commandments have a narrow and a broad application. So as we move from uh, the very narrow application of you shall not murder, and we think about it specifically in terms of killing, wrongfully killing another human being, we recognize that the commandments also have a broader application. And here, more broadly understood, this commandment also prohibits inflicting harm on a person through striking or hurting them. Uh, We think about what falls short of murder the attacks on other person's bodies that cause physical harm. We also think about slander, doing violence to their name. We've talked recently about the name and the connection between uh, someone's name and their identity, someone's person and their name. And we talked about this, of course, in the third commandment when we were told that we shall not take the, Lord, the Lord's name in vain. So we're to honor God's name. To take the Lord's name in vain, to dishonor God's name, is to dishonor him. And if we follow that same logic out to how we treat one another, to slander another person is to do violence to their name. It is to, in a sense, verbally take them out in society. It is to destroy their reputation. This too should be understood as part of the sixth commandment. And I think as we think about harm, you know, uh, Jennifer and I were recently watching a movie where uh, there was a a situation where there there was a drug dealer and a person whose life was being destroyed by drugs. We watched a few documentaries on this sort of thing. And I think a a lot of drug dealers are going to be surprised when they get to God's judgment. And they realize all the murder in their wake of the people who, who, to whom they've sold drugs, who've died on these drugs, whose lives have been wrecked by these drugs. So many ways that harm can be inflicted, and slander is a way that we harm someone's person by harming their name. Different ways we think about violence and the Sixth Commandment. But it goes even beyond that. It goes even beyond slander all the way to the deepest recesses of the heart. And that's where we come to our second aspect of this commandment's application when it comes to anger. We must understand the sixth commandment in terms also of anger. Jesus addresses the sixth commandment directly in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 24 says this. Listen closely to how Jesus deals with the sixth 
commandment. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Do you see what Jesus is doing? He's taking it deep into the heart. Whoever insults his brother <coughs> excuse me, will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. You know, think about that for a moment. Uh, Everyone in this room can readily say that we've done something like you fool, right? Even if we're by ourselves in our car or wherever. All of us have, can readily think of times where we've done something, we maybe, maybe didn't say fool, we maybe said something far worse, but we've said something like this. We've done this, and every kid in this room has done this as well. Notice what Jesus says. It's striking. It really catches us off guard. He says, whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. People standing in God's presence on the day of final judgment. I never killed anyone. I never murdered anyone. Oh, yes, you did, says Christ the judge. Yes, you have. Here, Jesus takes the commandment to the deepest level, to the level of our thoughts and our feelings. It is not merely a matter of not hitting or killing another person. It is a matter of being angry with someone in your heart. Well, we are all guilty of that for sure in the last probably 24 hours. Being angry with someone in our heart. Having hate towards another human being. And, and watch the way anger works in the heart As we think about the relationship between hate and anger and how closely wedded together they are and how the two blend together in our actions and the way we think and the way we speak. There are two stories in Genesis that make this abundantly clear. The relationship between anger and murder. And even specifically the relationship between what goes on in the heart, the murder of the heart, and the murder in the act. We see this with Cain. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 5, it, it's not just a random out of a vacuum moment when Cain kills his brother Abel, but we see there's a trail of anger. There are the, the stepping stones of anger leading to blood, leading to the shedding of blood. Genesis 4, verse 5, but for Cain and his offering, God had no regard. Abel brings an offering. First of the flock, God accepts it. Cain brings some of the field. Uh, We're we're meant to understand, I think, from Hebrews 11 that, that Cain does not come in faith. He doesn't come with reverence to the Lord. So for Cain and his offering, God had no regard. So what's the response? Did Cain fall on his face before God and confess his sin and say, Lord, I have done wrongly in your sight. Let me correct my ways and bring an offering that honors you. No. The response is, so Cain was very angry, exceedingly angry, and his face fell. He's not just depressed, he's seething with anger, with rage. He's seething with hate, malice, all those nasty anger words that we find throughout the Bible. If we dot, dot, dot our way up to verse 8, we see where that goes, verse 8, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. The road to the bloodshed was the road of anger. We see it also so clearly with Joseph's brothers. In Genesis chapter 37, verse 4. So listen to how the text progresses in verse 4. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers... Here it is. 
they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. And then verse 8. So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. We've got, we've got hate. We've got a lot more hate. <coughs> and then verse 18. They saw him from afar. So here comes Joseph going to check on his brothers. His father sent him. And here they see this hated brother coming their way. They saw him from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. And we know what happened. He ends up getting thrown into a pit. And there are two of his brothers who try to, the first brother thinks he'll get him in a pit, rescue him. The second brother, uh, Judah, thinks, well, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him. But we see here the intention of taking away his life. Now, it's interesting as we look at, as we consider the stepping stones between anger and the act of murder, we also see the common thread between both of these stories in Genesis. We see the common thread of envy. Notice that. This common thread of jealousy. And it reminds us of the murder of Jesus with the religious leaders. Jesus was not tried and condemned, strictly speaking. Jesus was murdered. Well, there was no trial. There was no justice. There were no witnesses according to the law. It was murder. It was organized murder. And why was Jesus murdered? Well, for the same reason Abel was murdered. And for the same reason that Joseph was going to be murdered. Because the religious leaders could not stand Jesus. Because they were jealous of him. They loved the praise of men. That was their God. And Jesus was getting all of it. And they were getting less. They hated Jesus. They murdered Jesus. All of this to say... That there is a world of murderous filth in the hearts of human beings. We are children of Adam like Cain. And that is why we read of murders every day in the news. We are not immune. We are not immune from any of this. We like Cain are children of Adam. We come from the same stock. From the same stock. But what about these murderous attitudes of our hearts that we so often neglect? Let's think about that for a moment. You know, we're, we're in here this morning and maybe not seething with anger. No hatred in there that we can think of right now. We haven't killed anyone this morning. So how do we think about the relation of this to our own hearts? Well, first, there's this envy. I want to go back to it. There's this envy James chapter 3, verse 16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Envy destroys your relationships. Envy destroys all of our relationships. Envy hates other people. It tears down other people. When we see what they have, when we see what they are, and it makes us feel small, it makes us feel less, it makes us feel inferior, then we begin to hate that person in our hearts. There is no way that you can envy a person and their life and love that person at the same time. Impossible. You're treating them as a mere container of what you love and worship. And you want that for yourself. You want that in this container, not in that one. Not a person, just a container of a desirable object. We also consider, as we apply this to ourselves, that this commandment deals with a lack of reconciliation. The text we just read, Matthew 5, in verse 24, it says, First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. This is the image of someone going to the altar to offer their sacrifice or their gift. And they realize that there, there is a problem with another human being. And what do they do? They leave that gift there. They reconcile first to their neighbor and then they come into God's presence. Let me ask you this this morning. <clears throat> 
Maybe the problem with your relationship with God, the disjointedness and the dryness of your relationship with God is you're trying to do the vertical without the horizontal. You're bringing all these things to the Lord and just hating your brother. Bringing all, or bringing all of these things to the Lord while remaining unreconciled to your brother or sister. Such worship is not acceptable to the Lord. Hear your Christ, as he says. First, be reconciled to your brother and then offer your gift. Maybe today there are some phone calls that need to be made. Some confession that needs to happen. Some conversations in the foyer that need to take place before you think about doing anything else. Also, as we think about applying this to ourselves, it involves verbally cutting down other people. Verbally tearing down other human beings. That's what Jesus is getting at when he says, you fool. This is a person speaking down to another human being. You, condemn, you contemptible little creature. You are nothing. Treating a person as a non-entity, as a non-person, verbally cutting down others. Maybe this is something that needs to be addressed in your life, the way you speak to other human beings in a contemptible, insulting way. And then finally, harboring anger and bitterness in our hearts. Maybe someone did something to you a while ago and you just have not forgotten it. You're just mad. And they haven't even bothered to apologize. I mean, they haven't even bothered to say anything to you. How could they have even done that? And you're just mad. And Satan is convincing you that's just quite all right. Because they wronged you and they haven't even asked for forgiveness. So it's quite all right. You just, you just grow that ball of madness, just like Cain. Just grow that ball of anger, grow that ball of resentment, enlarge that ball of bitterness in your heart. Maybe that's happening. Listen to the words of Ephesians 4, verse 26. Be angry. There is a, a kind of anger that is Normal and natural and even righteous indignation. Be angry and do not sin. Jesus was angry when he went into the temple. He did not sin. As he drove out the money changers, as he drove out the cattle, he was angry. But he did not sin. Jesus was angry with the Pharisees. And he rebuked them. But he did not sin. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. How many suns have gone down on your anger? How many times has the sun risen and set with all that ball of bitterness just growing in your heart? Child of God, listen to the sixth commandment. Listen to our Lord as he expounds upon the sixth commandment and he takes it to the very depths of our hearts. When we let the sun go down on our anger, we give opportunity to the devil. And the devil will ravage our lives with undealt with anger. He will ravage our relationships. He'll destroy our witness. He'll steal away all of our joy. He'll make us an unfruitful Christian simply because we've given him opportunity by letting the sun go down on our anger. So what is the opposite? What is the opposite of this murder, this murder of heart that Jesus refers to here in Matthew chapter five? Well, I think John tells us the opposite in 1 John chapter 3, verses 14 to 18. And here's what he says. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Let me say that again. Everyone who hates, or let's, let's let John say that again. Everyone who hates his brother 
is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. In other words, undealt with perpetual anger uh, that, that you just never have a problem with and, and confess to the Lord or repent of is a, would, would be a demonstration that you don't have Christ. It's a demonstration that you have no eternal life abiding in you. He goes on to say, by this we know love. This is the opposite. That he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. That's the opposite. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. This commandment calls us away from the other, that anger, that bitterness, that resentment, that hate, and it calls us toward self-giving, self-denying, others-oriented, caring love. That's what the Holy Spirit does in a child of Adam. That's what the Holy Spirit does in someone who would otherwise be a civilized American Cain. So we see here, first, violence, secondly, anger, and then thirdly, negligence. And this is where we'll finish up this morning, negligence. As I mentioned earlier, one of the things that makes translating the verb in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, so difficult is that it is used for accidental killing throughout Numbers 35, which Cody read earlier, for this person, the manslayer. The one who slays a man. Uh, in, in the text there, in Numbers 35, it's the same verb used in the commandment. But it's translated in light of the way it is to be understood as a man slayer. So we read this in verse 11. Then you shall select cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the man slayer who kills any person without intent may flee there. And so uh, there was this system in Israel uh, where the avenger of blood, the family member who was tasked with avenging the death of the person who had been killed, if there was an accidental death, then this person could flee to a city of refuge. And their case, of course, would be heard by the congregation. They would have to stay in the city of refuge. If they left the city of refuge, they could be killed by the avenger. But if they remained there until the death of the high priest, then they could leave afterwards. And there's a lot packed in there about the sort of substitutionary nature there of the high priest. Also, there's a lot packed in there about uh, the seriousness of bloodshed and all of that, which we won't get into. But it is important that you understand here that there is this category in Numbers 35 of a manslayer, a person who accidentally kills another. In these cases, there is no premeditation. There is no passion to kill. There's no person overcome with anger who strikes out. These are not acts of murder, strictly speaking, and yet the verb from the Ten Commandments is used. And here's the question I want to pose. Why? Why is it that this is the same verb? It could have easily been a different verb. And I think the answer is found in the idea of negligence. This idea of negligence. Negligence is sometimes really hard to determine. And especially in a broken world, especially as we consider all of the ways uh, in which uh, our own minds are imperfect, our abilities are imperfect, we are so limited, we are not perfectly functioning people at any point in time. We're not perfectly aware, we're not perfectly consistent, We're not perfectly careful in any way. And I think this whole manslayer category leaves room for that. It recognizes just the fallenness of man and the fallibility of people. There's a broad range of accidents. And as we think about it in relation to negligence. But I think the answer is found here in the idea of negligence. And and we read of One sort in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 5. So there's someone out in the forest, okay? Uh, When someone goes into the forest with his neighbor to cut wood, and his hand swings the axe to cut down a tree. He's just cutting down a tree. 
He's not trying to kill his neighbor. He's not trying to take someone's life. He's simply swinging an ax to cut down a tree. And the head slips from the handle and strikes his neighbor so that he dies. He may flee to one of the cities and live. This is a perfect illustration of the sort of just pure accident that can happen where someone is, is out doing something and it's just, a, it's just a pure accident. And there would be the city of Refuge. Now you have a very different situation in Exodus chapter 21, verses 28 to 29. Listen to this. When an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be stoned and its flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall not be liable. But, and here's the, the big contrast, but... If the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past, this is a a biting pit bull. Maybe we could draw out our own kind of illustration. This This is an animal that is aggressive. This is an animal that has attacked. This is an animal that has... Uh, been accustomed to this in the past, and its owner has been warned about that, but has not kept it in. Listen to this. And it kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and its owner also shall be put to death. Now that is striking. That is an incredible level of culpability for negligence. Now, the truth is we don't know what kind of negligence was present or even if there was, strictly speaking, negligence in the case of the axe head. But here it is clear that there is a very high level of negligence. So there's clearly a spectrum. There's a spectrum of responsibility here. And we see this reflected in manslaughter laws. Different levels of manslaughter and different kinds of negligence. And so uh, the, the law applies in all of these manifold ways from society to society as the truth of the matter, the facts of the case, and the intention of the person, the past history of the person. All these things are weighed out in court. But the point I am making here is that the wording of this commandment leaves open application to negligence. That's the point I'm making. It leaves open application to negligence. It calls the hearer or the reader, in our case, to a high level of care when it comes to human life. In every way that we can, we should seek to protect and preserve human life. And accidents will happen. Accidents can happen. But in every way that we can, in our fallenness, in our limitations, in our lack of focus, in our just general tiredness, In every way that we can, we should seek, according to the sixth commandment, to protect and preserve human life. To cut down on accidents as much as we possibly can and to ensure as far as we are able that we are careful with human life. We're careful in how we drive. We're careful in making sure that there's not a wet floor for someone to slip on. We're careful to make sure that there's not a knife lying on the counter. Insofar as we are able, we are safety conscious people. Not because safety is good, but because of the Lord. And human life is so special to him. And all of this takes us back, as we think about negligence, all of this takes us back to 1 John. The sixth commandment tells us that we are to seek the well-being of other people. So it's, it's more specific than just don't kill people, don't hit people, don't slander people, don't hate people in your heart, don't harbor anger towards people, don't call them names. It also has to do with actively, positively speaking, seeking the well-being of other human beings. It has a positive application. That we are not to disregard the good of others. That we are to preserve and help in the sustaining and flourishing of their lives. All of this housed in the sixth commandment. Philippians chapter 2 verses 3 to 4 is probably the best passage for this sort of thing. It says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That's what it means not to murder. 
Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. That's what it looks like to not murder. And in this sense, and here we're going to see how much the law really does condemn us, apart from Christ. In this sense, all selfishness is a breaking of the sixth commandment. Think about that for a moment. All selfishness is a breaking of the sixth commandment. So every person who would stand up before God and say in in God's face, in the face of God's law, I've never murdered anybody. It's a laughing stock in heaven. It's a laughing stock among the angels of God. Of course we all have. Because we are all by nature in Adam selfish creatures. Selfishness is to focus on self at the expense of others. It is to make others smaller and even non-existent because of the elevation and love of self. Even selfishness understood in the sixth commandment. So what are we to do? As we leave here, As those who are in Jesus Christ, as those who have the Holy Spirit, whose sins have been paid for by Christ, who has Christ interceding for us in heaven, who has Christ's Spirit in us, conforming us into his likeness. And the answer is this, spiritual warfare. We talked about Satan before. We give Satan opportunity. Listen to the way Jesus describes Satan in John chapter 8, verse 44. He says that Satan was a murderer from the beginning. Who is Satan? Who is the devil? He's the murderer. He's the murderer. All of Satan's wiles and all of Satan's schemes are bent towards his murderous ambitions. We see it at the fall, and we've seen it ever since. Satan wants all of us to murder, and murder, and murder, and murder. In all the ways we've discussed, he wants us to be filled with violence. He wants our hearts full of anger. He wants our minds full of negligence and care of self. That's Satan's agenda for all of us, for each of us, and for us as a church. So the answer is to wage war against Satan with the full armor of God. Ephesians 6, to put on the full armor of God and to fight the good fight of faith, to fight the good fight of love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you call us to know you as our holy God and you call us to reflect you in our holy conduct. Lord, we thank you for making so clear to us in your word the depth of your commands and the depth of our sin. Thank you, Lord, that you have, through the blood of our Savior, you have redeemed us from these hell-deserving sins. Lord, we thank you that through Christ, our sins are forgiven. Our sins are paid for. And we are called to rejoice, not to mull over our past sins, not to be defeated by them, not to live under the dominion of those things, under the guilt of those things, but to with humility and dependence upon you to rejoice in the Lord. So Father, we pray that we would be grateful and that we would be glad in Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us in no way to murder Help us to guard our own hearts, as Proverbs says. Help us to be free of all anger and hate. And Lord, lead us and guide us this very day in ways that we maybe need to have a conversation with another person in the way that we need to confess our own sin regardless of the other person's sin, in the ways that we need to forgive and ask for forgiveness regardless of what the other person does. Lord, help us to be faithful to your word, and not to make up our own ethic as we are often deceived by the evil one. Father, help us to fight the good fight of faith and to put on the full armor of God as we wage war against spiritual powers that would have us live lives of murderous anger. We pray for your grace. 
We ask for your blessing over the Lord's Supper. We pray that our hearts will be filled with joy as we look at this sign and symbol and as we meditate on what you have purchased for us through Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.